In this video, our aim is to establish three historical facts. Number one, St. Augustine of the 5th century was the first known Christian leader to promote a Calvinistic soteriology. Number two, St. Augustine was influenced by Gnostic Manichaeanism and its deterministic philosophy for about a decade of his life prior to becoming a Christian. Number three, the Reformers, especially Martin Luther and John Calvin, were greatly influenced by Augustine in their formation of modern Calvinistic soteriology. Our goal in this video is simply to present the facts. As has been said, facts don't care about feelings. We want the audience to objectively understand the facts of the matter so as to make an educated decision. So do the facts support the claim that Augustine was the first known Christian leader to promote a Calvinistic soteriology? There are literally dozens of quotes from non-Calvinistic sources who would establish this fact. However, that could come across as bias. So why not listen to Calvinistic sources and their findings with regard to the history of Calvinism? A respected Calvinistic historian, Lorraine Butner, wrote, The early church fathers placed chief emphasis on good works such as faith, repentance, almsgiving, prayers, submission to baptism, etc. as the basis for salvation. They, of course, taught that salvation was through Christ, yet they assumed that man had full power to accept or reject the gospel. They, the early church leaders, taught a kind of synergism in which there was a cooperation between grace and free will. This cardinal truth of Christianity was first clearly seen by Augustine, the great spirit-filled theologian of the West. In his Doctrine of Sin and Grace, he went far beyond the earlier theologians, taught an unconditional election of grace, and restricted the purpose of redemption to the definite circle of the elect. We cannot be more unbiased than to look at John Calvin's own conclusions with regard to the early church writings. John Calvin said, All ancient theologians, with the exception of Augustine, are so confused, vacillating, and contradictory on this subject that no certainty can be obtained from their writings. Calvin admitted, It may perhaps seem that I have greatly prejudiced my own view by confessing that all the ecclesiastical writers, with the exception of Augustine, have spoken too ambiguously or inconsistently on this subject that no certainty is attainable from their writings. But were the early church writings really unclear about these doctrines? Or could it be that John Calvin just could not find any of them that agreed with him except for the writings of Augustine? We encourage you to do exactly what Dr. Ken Wilson did. He went back and read the early church fathers for himself. He's an Oxford theologian, a orthopedic hand surgeon, and he wrote a book on the subject we encourage you to read. You'll notice the first person on that list there, he's actually mentioned in the book of Philippians in the scripture, Clement of Rome. Let's listen to what he says. Clement said that free will was given because he who is good by his own choice is really good but he who is made good by another under necessity is not really good, because he is not what he is by his own choice. Clement said, It is therefore in the power of every one, since man has been made possessed of free will, whether he shall hear us to life or the demons to destruction. Clement said, For no other reason does God punish the sinner, either in the present or in the future world, except because he knows that the sinner was able to conquer, but neglected to gain the victory. Ignatius, known to be discipled by the Apostle John himself, produced some of the earliest church writings and was martyred by lions in Rome for his Christian faith. Ignatius said, If anyone is truly religious, he is a man of God. But if he is irreligious, he is a man of the devil, made such not by nature, but by his own choice. Ignatius said, And there is set before us life upon our observance of God's precepts, but death as the result of disobedience, and everyone, according to the choice he makes, shall go to his own place. Let us flee from death and make choice of life. Another influential church author was Tertullian. He was a Christian apologist who was known for fighting against Gnosticism in his day. He's most known for his work on the doctrine of the Trinity. Tertullian said, No reward can be justly bestowed. No punishment can be justly inflicted upon him who is good or bad by necessity, and not by his own choice. Tertullian said, 
you will find that when he sets before man good and evil, life and death, that the entire course of discipline is arranged in precepts by God's calling men from sin and threatening and exhorting them, and this on no other ground than that man is free with a will, either for obedience or resistance. Literally hundreds of more quotes are provided by Dr. Ken Wilson and other scholars, but you're going to have to do your own homework if you don't believe us. Go read the original sources for yourself. We encourage you to do that. The second fact that we wanted to establish in this video is that Augustine was influenced by Gnostic Manichaeanism and its deterministic philosophy prior to becoming a Christian. John K. Ryan, in his introduction to The Confessions of St. Augustine, said, The two great intellectual influences upon Augustine prior to his conversion were Manichaeism and Greek philosophy. In their introduction to The Confessions of Augustine, John Gibb and William Montgomery said, in the same year in which he read the scriptures and was disappointed in them, Augustine joined the Manichaean sect. For nearly nine years, Augustine was a Manichaean auditor. At first, he was a zealous partisan who contended publicly for his new faith and did not hesitate to ridicule the doctrines of the church and especially the Old Testament scriptures. These are simply undisputed facts of the matter. St. Augustine was a Manichaean for about nine or ten years of his life, and Manichaean Gnosticism did hold to a more deterministic philosophy. Lyman Beecher said, The free will and natural ability of man were held by the whole church. Natural inability was to that of the pagan philosophers, the Gnostics, and the Manichaeans. The fact is, Gnosticism did promote a form of determinism. That is not to say that everyone who followed Augustinian theology were fully deterministic or fully Gnostic. It's simply to show that determinism was rooted in Gnosticism, not the early church writings. W. F. Hook said, The Manichaeans so denied free will as to hold a fatal necessity of sinning. It's also an established fact that Augustine, when he converted from Manichaeanism to Christianity, that he defended the doctrine of free will held by the early church. Augustine said, We Christians assert the liberty of the will, whereby our actions are rendered either moral or immoral, and keep it free from every bond of necessity on account of the righteous judgment of God. It wasn't until Augustine's dispute with the Pelagians that he begins to abandon his previous views of free will and adopt a more deterministic understanding of salvation. Augustine said, I have tried hard to maintain the free choice of the human will, but the grace of God prevailed. Bosob said, Augustine defended free will so long as he had to do with the Manichaeans, but when he came to dispute with the Pelagians, he changed his system. Then he denied that kind of freedom which before he had defended, and so far as I am able to judge, his sentiments no longer differed from theirs, the Manichaeans, concerning the servitude of the will. He ascribed the servitude to the corruption which original sin brought into our nature, whereas the Manichaeans ascribed it to an evil quality eternally inherited in matter. Another fact of the matter is Augustine came from North Africa. He spoke Latin, not Greek. The third and final point we want to establish in this video is that the reformers, especially Martin Luther and John Calvin, were greatly influenced by St. Augustine in their formation of modern Calvinistic soteriology. William Carlos Martin said about Luther, The study of the Bible and of Augustine theology led him to the Redeemer. Johann Heinrich Kurtz said, Luther zealously studied the Bible along with the writings of Augustine. Thomas H. Dyer said in his biography of John Calvin, The doctrine of predestination, which is generally regarded as that of which principally characterizes Calvin, is in fact that of St. Augustine. Oliver Joseph Thatcher said, In theology, he, Calvin, was a close follower of St. Augustine. His influence was to revivify the ideas of St. Augustine and joining them to the main ideas of the Reformation, embody them in the church he organized. The Encyclopedia of Religion and Ethics said, Luther, Zwingli, and Calvin, with minor divergences, agree in the reverting to St. Augustine on the main issues and in the supposed interests of evangelical piety. Dr. R.C. Sproul, a well-known Calvinistic theologian, has said, quote, 
It has been said that all of Western theology is a footnote to the work of Augustine. This is because no other writer, with the exception of the biblical authors, has had more influence on Christendom. When Martin Luther and John Calvin were accused of teaching new doctrine, they pointed to Augustine as an example of one who had taught the things they were teaching." End quote. In fact, John Calvin references Augustine 4,119 times in his works. The Encyclopedia of Religion and Ethics said, It is Augustine who gave us the Reformation. For the Reformation, inwardly considered, was just the ultimate triumph of Augustine's doctrine. The Reformation came, seeing that it was on its theological side, a revival of Augustinianism. The Christian spectator said, Augustine and Calvin and all of the reformers taught the bondage or moral impotence of the will. It should be noted that not all reformers adopted a Calvinistic soteriology. There were those who were working on reforming the Catholic Church long before Martin Luther came along, men like Balthazar Hubmeier, who stood firmly on the doctrine of the freedom of the will and man's responsibility in salvation. There was also Philip Melanchthon, the Greek scholar there in Wittenberg, who by Martin Luther's own assessment was the greater of the scholars, yet he too did not side with Calvinistic soteriology. Right now in human history, Calvinism is resurging, and therefore there are a lot of voices that give support to this Calvinistic way of thinking. Therefore, it may seem like this is the most popular accepted view, especially if you get your information online. We encourage you, however, to go to the original sources. Read the best scholars from both perspectives. Be good Bereans and judge for yourself what is right. For more information, please go to Sotriology101.com. If you can support us, click the support link in the top right corner and become a monthly donor or give a one-time gift to help spread the news of God's love and provision for all people.